couple minutes to let a few people trickle in and then we'll get started. There's a lot of people on this call. <laughs> yeah, it's exciting. Okay, so I think we're gonna get started. Uh, welcome to everyone joining us tonight and a huge thank you to Sonia and Anami for being here. Um, I'm Kate O'Connor, the BC Green candidate in Saanich South, and I'm joining you from the unceded territories of the Wissanich peoples and the Lekwungen speaking peoples. As you may know, BC is currently in the last days of a snap general election and voters in Toronto Centre are in the final days of an unexpected by-election. Here in BC, we go to the polls this coming Saturday and voters in Toronto Centre go to the polls on Monday. It is exciting times for the, B for the Greens, both nationally and here in BC. We have new leadership, we have growing membership, and we have an even stronger recogni recognition across the country that politics needs our voices to be loud, clear, and forward-looking. I know I've been spending every waking hour over the last three weeks thinking about Green Party politics because I'm running in this BC election. And on the campaign trail, I found more and more people who see that the Green Party represents a new wave of politics. Mm -hmm. We're standing up to dangerous status quo decision-making and we're being heard. Greens federally and provincially are the only ones with policies that match the urgency of the crises we face. And we combine that with compassion and a dedication to honesty in politics. I've also been encouraged by how much the Green parties of both British Columbia and Canada value youth voices. Before turning 18, I had the opportunity to vote in two Green Party leadership races over the last few months. And I'm very pleased to say both of the leaders I voted for are here with me tonight. Um, and before we get to Sonia and Anami, we are honored to be joined by Peter Bevan Baker, the leader of the official opposition in PEI and the leader of the PEI Greens. He has some words to share for Sonia and Anami, as well as voters in Toronto Centre and BC. So welcome, Peter. That's so kind of you, Kate. Thank you. Can you hear me all right, Kate? Wonderful. Well, thank you uh, and good evening from Prince Edward Island. Merci et bonsoir de l'île de Prince Edward, Quay, um, uh, talk Epiquet. Uh, it's a real pleasure and it's an honor actually for me to be joining this wonderful panel this evening from the other side of our beautiful country. And despite all of the problems that we're currently enduring, whether they be um, social, environmental, economic, or political, Canada is still a glorious country to live in. And um, I, I feel blessed every day and stop and remind myself of how lucky I am to live in this little part of a, of a very large and beautiful country. And it's made more glorious by people like Sonia and like Anami, who have stepped forward to be political leaders at this most turbulent and most needy time. So again, it's a real honor for me to share this virtual stage with, with them. And I have to say, I feel a little bit like an imposter here. I also feel a little bit like one of the last vestiges of a disappearing um, political class, and that's the pale, stale male. And I'd, I'd be very glad when, when we do not hold the, the position of influence that we have for so very, very long in this country. And I, I don't say that, um, I say that unapologetically. I am who I am. I'm not a bad person. I, I, uh, I think I'm a good guy, but I, I absolutely see the need for diversity in our politics. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it, it would be wrong of me not to acknowledge the privilege 
that comes with the fact that I am who I am. And that in large part has allowed me to ascend to the political role that I currently hold, which is the leader of the official opposition here in our legislature. Um, I sit in the second oldest legislature in Canada and on the walls of our parliament are a large number of beautiful portraits of uh, aged bearded men. And it's a real reminder to those of us who sit in the seats of our legislature of the narrowness of the political history and traditions of, of my island and, and of this country. And thankfully the beards now are mostly gone as I look around our legislature, but the attitudes of that time um, linger. They certainly linger in some corners of the room. And I look forward to the day when real diversity, um, pure diversity is more better, is better displayed in our, in our, um, in our legislature. And diversity, of course, brings strength and it brings, um, it brings beauty and it brings health and it, br it builds resilience. And that's true whether it's in agriculture, whether it's in an economy, whether it's in an ecosystem, and it's equally true in politics for the same reasons, because we need to bring strength and health uh, through diversity in our politics. And that diversity has to come not just from ethnicity or religious background, but it has to be diversity in age, it has to be diversity in gender, it has to be diversity in lived experience. We need to have our communities better represented in our legislatures. And here on PEI, I lead a caucus of eight, eight members as the official opposition here. Five of those members identify as women. Six of our members have young children, school-aged children, actually preschool-aged children, four of them. One of them has a child on the way. And when you have that sort of diversity within your caucus, you have a very different um, approach to issues you have very different perspectives on what issues should be priorities. And I feel very blessed to sit in the corner of a room where in the last 18 months, we have done more to move the needle on diversity in our legislature than has happened in the last 180 years. The change in this world is, is happening fast and it's happening profoundly. And we need a politics that's able to keep up with that change. Um, a politics that's not born of the attitudes and the traditions of the old parties, but a politics that is shaped by the necessities, the, the realities and the needs of today and, and looking into the future. We have some wicked problems that we need as a society to deal with. Climate change, of course, would be at the top of that list. We have a crisis in health in healthcare, particularly in mental health care, and I think that's probably true not just here in Prince Edward Island, but across our country. We have poverty and disparity and inequality, which is which is increasing throughout our society. We have an econ an economic system which is no longer providing for the needs of a, a, an ever increasing large number of people. And that gets displayed in precarity of jobs, in unaffordability of housing, in lack of access to some basic services like healthcare and education. The, the economy is no longer serving the people. We have some enormously big problems. Where are we going to look for leadership? Well, layered on top of all this, of course, at the moment is the COVID crisis. And if you look at the countries that have weathered the COVID turbulence better than any others, you will see that they are led by women. If we look um, at countries like Iceland, where Katrin uh, uh, Jakobsdittir is, is, the, is the leader, or in Scotland, my own home country, where Nicola Sturgeon is the leader, or of course, New Zealand, where the extraordinary Jacinda Ardern has, has um, guided her country through this most turbulent time, the women are getting it done. They are recognizing what needs to be done, what sort of leadership is required, and they are guiding their communities and their citizens and their societies through this turbulence in a way that many other countries led by men and, uh, are, are just failing left, right, and center. I've never felt greater trepidation for the future of humanity and the planet on which we live. 
but I've also never felt greater excitement and confidence in the new political leaders that are coming forward here in Canada, in, embodied by people like Sonia and Anna Mee, who are the women that we need to provide the leadership in, in a most turbulent time, in a time of great need, in a time where we are looking for new leadership to provide a new voice of new hope in this new age. And I thank you, Sonia, and I thank you, Anami, for your inspiring leadership and for being the courageous and the beautiful and caring and lovely people that I know you to be. And I am, I'm so, again, honored to share this virtual stage with you, and I wish you the best of luck in your imminent by-election, Anami, and election, um, Sonia, across the province of British Columbia. Thank you so much. Merci. Walalin. Well, Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much for joining us. My pleasure. Um, so tonight I'm going to start off by asking Sonia and Anami some questions I have and then questions that have been pre-submitted. But I will also be monitoring the chat box. So if you have any questions, you can ask them in the chat box as well as on Facebook Live and we'll do our best to get to them. So I feel like neither of these incredible women really need an introduction, especially after Peter spoke, but I was asked to do one. So here goes. <laughs> Anami Paul is a human rights lawyer. She started an NGO dedicated to increasing diversity in political leadership, and she was just elected leader of the Federal Green Party of Canada. Anami is the first woman of color, first black person and first Jewish woman to lead a major federal party in Canada. She speaks English, French, Catalan, and Spanish, and like us out here in British Columbia, is currently running in an irresponsible election that should not be happening during a pandemic. Anami is running in Toronto Centre, where her grandmother worked as a nurse and her mother worked as a teacher. Toronto Centre has too long been represented by politicians who care little about what is happening for people who live there. Anami is working hard to represent her home riding and make the Green Party the most diverse, democratic, and daring force in Canadian politics. And we are also joined by Sonia Furstenau. Sonia was a high school teacher in Shawnigan, British Columbia, when she first began organizing with her community to stop a permit allowing contaminated water to be dumped in the Shawnigan watershed. After years of hard work, Sonia, along with her community, got the permit revoked. Sonia was then elected to the BC Legislature as the MLA for Cowichan Valley. In the BC Legislature, Sonia has worked tirelessly for her community and for all British Columbians over the past three and a half years. And in September, Sonia was elected as leader of the BC Greens. When I had the opportunity to see Sonia at work in the legislature this summer, and when I worked on her leadership campaign, I saw firsthand how profoundly she cares for people. Sonia is fearlessly leading the BC Greens as we seek to achieve a truly just and sustainable province. In a sea of parties led by men, Anami and Sonia are showing us what strong female leadership looks like. And in this critical moment in history, both Sonia and Anami are leading from a place of compassion and evidence-based decision-making, making plans to help people both now and in the long term breaking out of the four-year planning cycle that for far too long has dictated the political decisions that got us into this mess in the first place. They're committed to working collaboratively across party lines to make the best decisions for everyone. Thank you both again for joining us today. Now it's time to hear from you. So my first question uh, to Anami first, uh, what motivated you to run for office in the first place? Uh, two things. One definitely was finding a party that I could believe in. You know, I had done a lot of things, as you heard over the years, that um, that required me to remain in the nonpartisan realm, but I had been in and around politics. I was very excited to be able to join a party, and I really needed it to be one that was, you know, that really encapsulated the things that you have said and that Peter said as well about um, being daring, about being compassionate, about being really committed to positive collective action on the biggest challenges. You know, we have, we are staring down um, some very, very 
big um, challenges and this is a very transformative moment and I wanted to be part of a group of people that uh, that believed in that and so uh, I also wanted to represent a community and that's something that's very important to remember about greens as much as we're focused on the big picture we never forget about the constituents uh, in our riding we never forget about the people who elected us and our, our duty to uh, to re um, represent them Toronto Centre is struggling. It is uh, one of the most uh, dense ridings, if not the densest riding in the entire country. It has an opioid crisis. It's the ground zero for the opioid crisis um, in Canada. It's the centre of the urban indigenous population uh, in Ontario. Um, half of, sorry, a third of the people live below the poverty line. Half of the people were born outside of the country. Um, you know, 40% of the children live in poverty. And so when Greens see that in a, in a community uh, that they care about, uh, they need to do something. And so this has been a liberal fortress for a long time, but I was very committed to running there uh, and, and just using all of, all of the things that, that you both mentioned, lived experience, personal experience, um, educational experience on behalf of the people in that community. And I believe if I can do it there, then really I can do it uh, anywhere, uh, because it really is just a microcosm of Canada. Great, thank you. Uh, Sonia, what first motivated you to run for office? Thanks, Kate, and I'll just start by saying I'm on Coast Salish territory here in Shawnigan mm. in the, the unceded territories of Cowichan tribes in Malahat Nation. Uh, delighted to be here with so many uh, amazing people uh, joining us, but also with uh, Anna Mee, uh, wonderful to be here with you, Peter Bevan Bacon, and I know he stepped off because it's it's quarter past darkness in uh, yeah. PEI right now. Um, <laughs> but I've I've long been an admirer and a friend of Peter's. And Kate, you know, you continue to just inspire me every time I see and hear you. Um, and as you pointed out, what motivated me to get involved was a, a permit that was granted for a, a, a company to put five million tons of contaminated soil literally at the headwaters of our drinking watershed in Shawnigan. And, and it was a moment of, for me, um, really, I, I had always seen government as a benign and often protective force in my life. Uh, I benefited so much from government programs, from an excellent public education system. Um, I'm, I'm bilingual because I, I was able to have French immersion as a child. Uh, I, I went to university when there was a tuition freeze and, and was able to pursue what I love studying because I had that, that, that capacity to afford it. I had childcare subsidies. Um, my mom, had, for a couple of years, we lived in, in subsidized housing. Uh, and so I'd always considered government to be this, this benign force. It does, it does good in our lives. And this was the first time that uh, you know, a government allowing a permit that would put arsenic and furans and dioxins and lead and hydrocarbons in a drinking watershed made no sense to me. And uh, along this journey of the last nine years, it's really been about, I want to be a person that helps restore people's trust in government, restores our faith in government. And, uh, and it's really, um, you know, it's really important to me to to, to always be honest, to speak the truth, as you say, to start from a place of evidence, to put solutions forward and to have a vision for a future that is uh, more promising and more hopeful than where we are right now. And I'm gonna throw it back at you, Kate, because I've seen a few questions about you um, and your choice to step up uh, right now. And I think yeah. I want the audience to be able to hear, but why, why are you in politics, Kate? What, what, how did we get here? Well, I mean, I, have stepped up for many reasons. One reason is because I didn't see uh, enough young people interested in politics or young people represented in the legislature. And as I've been going on the campaign trail, I've been talking a lot about the need for intergenerational leadership. Um, like Peter spoke to earlier, you know, we need people with all perspectives in, in power to make decisions about the future because we're in a crucial moment in history. And for me, uh, you know, the fact that we're on the brink of climate chaos is definitely one of the reasons why I saw it necessary to speak up and stand up and run in this election. And, you know, it was a bit, uh, a bit scary at first stepping up as a young woman, but I have had great female uh, leaders as role models in uh, both, both of you, Sonia and Anami. 
Uh, so my next question is actually, as both of you are influential female leaders, have either of you had a female leader who has been an important influence in your life? And uh, this time we're gonna start with Sonia. Well, of course, as Greens, uh, all of us can recognize the role that Elizabeth May has played uh, as leader of the party. Um, and again, as somebody who got into politics uh, to stand up for what she truly believes, to, to always work from a place of evidence, um, and she has been an inspiration um, for a long time. Uh, I think that, and, and this is one of the things we talked about when I was growing up in the seventies, there was this story that we were being told as young girls that, that you can do anything, you can be anything. And yet we, I didn't see a lot of female leaders in politics. And when we saw, you know, Kim Campbell was prime minister for a very short time and then you know, the conservatives were voted out and that was that. And we've seen these moments when women have been in leadership roles, but, but they're not long enough, they're not lasting. Uh, and what we need is, is to see more of those. Um, all the women uh, that have taken the leap to, to take a leadership role, uh, and I'm sure Anami, you can, uh, you can also sense this. Um, it's, it's not easy, mm -hmm. it's not, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it, it, there are challenges and, and barriers and um, implications for women that I think are, are very, um, very much for us to bear. Um, and, and what I hope, and I think I'm starting to see it, is that as we have more women in leadership roles and as we open that space uh, for, for people like you, Kate, to, to join us here, um, we are going to see those barriers d diminish, um, but it is it is not an easy choice to make, uh, and it has a lot of a lot of challenges. I'm glad I did it. I'm glad I'm here, um, but it's 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 a tough choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've I've definitely uh, you know had a lot of people say to me it's it must be scary to be running as a young woman but like i said before it's definitely easier to see both you sonia and anami stepping up and being strong female leaders so anami have you had a, a female leader who's really inspired you in your life i think as i was going well first you know people should know because i for me it's very important that we try to demystify some of politics and people do get a sense of the the process that um, that those of us who have taken this leap, those of us who haven't been, at least in my case, previously involved in politics, uh, the journey, uh, and a part of it involves Sonia. You know, we had a couple of really important conversations, both of us, when we were deciding whether to run or not. Uh, one of the things that I think sets women, um, particularly women of a certain age, um, apart from their male counterparts, is that we really think about the entire community when we're deciding to run. And by that, I mean our family, our extended family, uh, the people in our community who count on us. Uh, you know, we think of the, 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 whole, um, the whole impact. And so I looked um, to women who were leaders like Sonia, women who had already been down that road in one way or another to, for advice and counsel. And I spoke to a lot of them. Um, and then I did other things, you know, every once in a while when I was feeling very challenged uh, um, and uncertain about the idea of running, I went and um, watched um, Knock Down the House on Netflix. For those of you who haven't seen it, please do. I also went and watched, uh, I think it's called Through the Looking Glass, which was the documentary about Kim Campbell and her run. Um, and I said during my, my speech uh, when I, um, after I won the leadership, that I really stand on the shoulders of, of all of those women who came before, regardless of their politics, because they certainly have made it easier, but it is not easy. And Sonia, it's very important that you said that. It, it, uh, the culture of politics, if it wants to attract um, the very best people, um, committed, compassionate people, it needs to become a more welcoming place. Mm -hmm. um, there are still too many people that think that the moment you decide to enter politics that you've lost your humanity, um, that think that um, you have actually lost your values, that the, you know, politics and, and strong values are incompatible. Um, and uh, you know, social media has made all of that worse. And so if we want um, people like you and Sonia, 
um, and myself really in politics, then um, we need to work to change uh, the culture. And we need to keep in mind that there have only been five women who have led a major political party in Canada, only five since Confederation. And two of those were Greens and I'm one of them. And so we have a very, very long way to go still. And I am also very inspired by you, Kate. I um, You've got gumption. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's uh, it's been it's been good so far. Uh, the campaign's been very busy uh, for me, and I'm sure you guys have both had very busy campaigns. So yeah. my next question actually ties into this. Uh, what has been the highlight for you of your campaign so far? Um, and Anna and me, we're starting with you this time. Uh, we're uh, working with all of these incredible people. It, it has been so inspirational uh, because I think that everything that I that I had hoped for in terms of politics happened uh, working with this team because what you hope for is that um, you can you can be inspired by other people you hope that uh, you can come together with people from all um, backgrounds from all parts of the country and build something together uh, and do it in harmony and do it with goodwill um, and I, I, I say sometimes zero drama, which uh, seems like a simple thing, but is actually a very tough feat. Um, and that people can come together to do something that has never been done before, before you know, that they can believe that the impossible is possible uh, and, and work toward it. And that is exactly what we need right now. And so after nine months of doing that during a pandemic, with people from all over this country, all different socioeconomic backgrounds, race, ethnicity, gender identities, you know, just everything. Um, being able to, to do that gives me a tremendous hope, uh, not only for the Green Party, um, but also for, for what we can accomplish still uh, in Canada. And I do have to take this opportunity to acknowledge that I am coming to you from the traditional territories of the Mississauga, Anishinaabe, Odnashone and the Huron Wendat. And I say that with a great deal of gratitude. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Sonia, what has been the highlight of your campaign so far? Well, I, I like enemy. I mean, and I'm just so inspired by uh, how everybody here in, in BC really threw themselves into this very unexpected election campaign. Uh, the team was incredible in getting 74 candidates on the ballot, getting a, a platform uh, together. And, and I encourage, I've seen a lot of questions going through. I really encourage everybody to go and look at our platform um, because it speaks to not only uh, the, our policies and outcomes, but how, how we would be uh, costing it uh, and recognizing that investments right now have to be very, very specific and clear about outcomes because we can't be, uh, we have to be so mindful of the money that we're spending as governments. Um, but I will say this, I am, I feel like I'm the luckiest candidate in British Columbia right now, because my team, my little bubble team consists of my son, my 26 year old son, who's taking all these beautiful pictures that everybody's seeing and setting up all of this. He has all these skills in audio and visual, and he has a beautiful camera. And then um, my friend Maeve, uh, Maeve McGuire. And uh, so I just get to be in a place of joy and happiness because I'm with two people that I just love dearly. Uh, and we, we just move through our very, very hectic, busy days. But I, I, get, uh, I get so much energy and, and happiness from who I'm spending my time with. So I, I'm very grateful and, and feeling very blessed uh, to have the company that I do through this uh, campaign. I do have to mention that my son also is has been both of my sons were here during the campaign that was one of the uh, few um, but really wonderful silver linings of the uh, the pandemic and uh, my, my 20 year old son has taken a year off from university and is still helping me quite a lot. And that has been very special and very unexpected um, to have him here and just to see him grow as a person has been fantastic and yes, he also set me up Sonia. There is nothing that you see actually behind me or beside me, anything that I am responsible for. Yeah. <laughs> but if, if, what people can't, they see this nice calm space. Exactly. Chaos in front of me. Exactly. <laughs> well, we're not going to pan. No, no 360 kind of, degree panorama. That's right. <laughs> put my blinders on. Nope. Going to clean up later. That's right. Um, 
I, I just want to jump in. I, I, I'm only seeing things jump by, but uh, there was something about retraining workers. And that is absolutely a part of our platform that if we're going to have a just transition, which we need to do, it has to involve supporting workers. It has to ensure that people are not um, coming out on the other side of the transition uh, without work, without retraining. It's so essential. Uh, and it's a, a very significant part of our platform. Um, and and I, you know, I've also just seen a few other notes about uh, where do I stand on workers and labor. My, the, we, this is the most important thing in our society is that our economy actually benefits the people who are working in it. And we've allowed that to become less and less a part of how our economy works, that the people that are doing the work are not, uh, not actually properly benefiting. And that's, that has to be central uh, to how our economy works. And uh, it's it's not an impossible goal. This is this is about making decisions that ensure uh, that the people are taken care of as the center of what we're doing. Yeah, that's that's a great point, and that ties into our first question uh, from Daniel, which is how do we show that we have a competitive economic plan for developing a green economy? Mm -hmm. um, and so, Anami, if you'd like to speak to that first. That's, yeah, that's easy. I love this one. This is our good news story that I'm going to be taking all around uh, the country. And I've already started, uh, in my case at least, I don't know about you, Sonia, we should keep a tally. Um, since October the 4th, I, I think that I've probably done about 115, 120 interviews all across the country. And um, you can probably hear it in my voice a little bit. <laughs> And uh, um, yes, and before anyone asks, yes, I do have a, I do have an issue with my thyroid. People have been writing in. A lot of women really worried about my voice and how it sounds. And yes, you have you have diagnosed it correctly. Um, it's very common with a lot of Black women. It's just one of those things. But I'm fine. Um, but yes, yeah, so the green economy. You know, this is a a tremendous um, opportunity. Uh, both to tackle the climate emergency by accelerating our transition um, and then also uh, to set us up for the future. So we know as Greens that uh, even in this moment of such tremendous loss and tragedy that we cannot lose sight of the climate emergency. It is an existential crisis. It has not gone away. It has gotten worse uh, despite you know, the, the misinformation about it having improved because people are driving less or it, is, it has continued to worsen uh, throughout the pandemic. And so we also know that we're going to be spending. I mean, there is a consensus across parties, across um, large economies, across central banks. Um, you know, everyone agrees on the right, on the left, everywhere that we are going to be spending hundreds of billions of dollars on uh, reanimating our economy, on repairing the economic and social damage. And so this wasn't where we expected to be, um, but uh, this is where we're, we're headed. Uh, and so how are we going to spend that money wisely uh, to set us up for the future and also to, um, to help us meet our targets for emissions reductions? And that is a green economy. And so there are very specific things in there like retrofits, um, uh, like uh, investments in clean tech uh, and in renewable energy in building the infrastructure to support a green economy, all of which will create jobs, all of which will help with a just transition, all of which will uh, generate uh, the revenue uh, we need for uh, the future and all of this, all of which will get us to net zero. So, you know, my brother was an oil worker out in BC, um, Alberta up until very recently. And this is a story he wants to hear and the workers on his crew want to hear. Um, and so we, we have something as Greens that we can tell people about where we're headed um, economically and socially that is very, very exciting um, if they put their trust in us to help uh, lead us there. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, thank you. Sonia, would you like to uh, add to that? Yeah, I'll follow up. I mean, Anami has hit a lot of really concrete and important points and, and Anami, I'm, I, I was losing my voice for the first few weeks of the campaign, and now it seems to have uh, strengthened. And, and yeah. so eventually, it, 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 the muscle will get strong. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you, you know, I, I'm just going to point to here in BC, um, the other two parties have agreed. They, they, they worked together to pass a bill that would that give $6 billion in um, government subsidies to LNG Canada. 
to, to, to tie us to this industry that can't even support itself financially, that needs government support to be viable. So that, that in and of itself should be recognized as financially irresponsible behavior on the part of the government. But not only that, that then you look at, well, what is it going to cost us to have this uh, ongoing fracking, the methane emissions, mm -hmm. the impacts to groundwater, uh, the, the seismic impacts from the fracking, uh, the pipeline going through territories, what Sowetan territory, and the conflict that that has created because that has not, that permission has not consent, has not been given. Uh, and then you get out to the LNG, um, you know, structures out on, on, the, on the West Coast, and you've got the largest point source emission of greenhouse gases. And, and what is that going to bring? Well, that's going to bring more climate impacts, more forest fires, more droughts, uh, more periods of flooding, which cost enormous amounts of money uh, across all levels of government, but particularly hit hard at local government uh, who have to, you know, who are mitigating and reacting to climate. It hurts our economy. Uh, and so, the, you know, the, the flip side of, of what the other parties are doing, their actions, are, are economically irresponsible. What we could be doing and need to be doing in British Columbia is moving into a clean energy economy. So we could have clean energy production in every region of the province. We are sitting on some of the, the best geothermal reserves uh, imaginable. And so not only could we be uh, extracting geothermal energy, we could also be at uh, the forefront of the innovation on how to extract that energy as cleanly as possible, how to store it, how to move it. Um, and what we're doing in, in this, and you know, we could have wind in, in certain regions, we could have solar, we could be looking at tidal power. Uh, and, and in doing this, we're creating far more jobs mm -hmm. in this sector than the oil and gas industry could ever be creating. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and not only that, but those jobs are actually where people live. You're not exactly. flying people out to work camps, mm -hmm. away from their communities, away from their families. They are working in their communities where they live. And we've seen examples of this already. Um, Tumblr Ridge and the, uh, the the wind energy work that the products that they've done are, uh, you know, they've created a wind energy industry in Tumblr Ridge that employs people locally. They work with the First Nation. Uh, they're developing technology. Uh, we have Souk Nation that is, has the solar farm and they use that to also provide energy to a, a sustainable aquaculture industry in their community. So it, it, it's the question of, do we stay locked in a past that is actually unhealthy, uh, economically unfeasible um, and, and increases our risk because of climate change? Or do we recognize what's entirely possible that we have everything in BC to, to move forward with and move with the urgency that we should be moving to build this clean energy economy in every region of the province. And so to me, I, I, it's sort of astonishing that we're the only party that is talking about this in this election. It's 2020, right? Like we know what we have to do at this point and, 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 and we're ready to make this move forward. And so, uh, that's that's my response and and in this of course of course we take care of workers of course we take care of people and the the whole platform our whole platform has at its center health and well-being of people of the environment of the climate we we have to recognize this is what government's role is supposed to be mm -hmm. is ensuring the health and well-being of the people who live uh, in our provinces, in our country. Exactly. Thank you. Um, so our next question, uh, we touched on it briefly and the last question is from Millie uh, about UNDRIP. So what is your position on the implementation of UNDRIP uh, and how would you implement the requirement for full prior and informed consent? Uh, and Sonia, we're going to start with you this time. So, I'm, I'm, you know, the bringing in UNDRIP, it was the, the number one uh, in our confidence and supply agreement with the NDP in 2017 that we created. So it was the number one item. And Adam Olson, my colleague, uh, 
um, he's the candidate for Saanich North in the Islands, was the MLA from 2017 until 2020. Uh, I, he worked so hard on this. He met with Scott Fraser, the, the former Minister of Indigenous uh, uh, Relations and Reconciliation. And Adam, his mission was to make sure that this, that we passed under, and we did last year, it's called the Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act. It's called DRIPA in BC. And there was a lot of ceremony. There was a lot of celebration. It was unanimously passed in the legislature in 2019. And then we had the first legislative session after that act was passed. And for Adam and me, that, that had to mean something. It meant that it was the lens that we were moving forward with on legislation in this province. And yet the government, the NDP government brought forward bills that deeply impacted First Nations and Indigenous peoples. And, and from what we could tell, there had been no substantive change in how that legislation was brought forward, in how the work was being done together with First Nations and Indigenous peoples. And, and we really, we really pushed back on that. We said, this is, if this is how we do it in the first session after we pass UNDRIP, then it becomes easier and easier for this to actually mean nothing in the future. Um, and so it, it has to mean something. It can't just be words. It can't just be, oh, we, we passed the legislation, our work is done. I know that the NDP said, well, we have a plan that we were bringing forward. Um, but really it has to mean something. And so that's, that's an example of um, what it meant to Adam and me that that legislation had been passed, uh, that it couldn't just be lip service. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll pass it over to Adam because it is a really important question. So in terms of UNDRIP, I, I spoke with, uh, with uh, um, uh, uh, Chief Belgard uh, just a couple of days ago, um, the National Chief for the Assembly of First Nations, and he said the way to think about it, because I expressed misgivings, you know, particularly after the experience of, of British Columbia, about the amount of, of energy that was being put into, uh, to, into UNDRIP, uh, because I do not believe that uh, UNDRIP really has any um, uh, any substance without uh, the political leadership and courage uh, to to accompany it. Mm -hmm. You know, they're they are just words until they're put into action. And there is, you know, there's a caveat. There's a very big caveat um, right there in in UNDRIP um, that can be used to escape uh, accountability if you really want to. And so I expressed those misgivings to him uh, because he is very supportive and the Assembly of First Nations is very supportive of UNDRIP and bringing it into le legislation. And he said, you have to think of it as two parts. You have to think of it as, as an eagle and one wing is UNDRIP, um, but the other wing has to be uh, uh, treaties and treaty rights. And you have to have the two of the things uh, together um, I would add, I don't know, there's only two wings on an eagle, but I would add another one. I really do believe that political will and, and having the, uh, the proper political leadership is absolutely key. And in two ways, um, you know, not just people who are um, willing to truly um, make UNDRIP a cross-cutting uh, um, theme. You know, the, the, again, the lens, as Sonia said, that uh, you use to um, um, filter every piece of legislation existing or proposed through, um, but also because political leadership will mean that um, uh, non-Indigenous peoples are, will be willing to make place for uh, Indigenous leadership, uh, which really should be what is um, leading the implementation of UNDRIP, whether at the provincial or the federal level. Um, so this is a very deep commitment, personal commitment of mine, uh, just because, you know, Indigenous peoples and Black, um, the Black diaspora share uh, a legacy of colonialism, and, and we know firsthand the devastating impact of it. Um, in the case of my people, they it wiped out everything, our entire um, sense of self, our culture, our history, our religions, our traditions, I don't know anything about those things, um, even back more than a few generations. Uh, so these are things really worth fighting for, and my job is to be a very strong ally and to take a back seat um, wherever I can uh, to make way for Indigenous leadership on the implementation of UNDRIP and 
and you know and, and the respective treaty rights and self determination and sovereignty. Mm -hmm. Thank you both for your answers. Uh, now uh, the next question is from Maureen um, about the overdose crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, Maureen asks, "What is the Green Party's plan on both federal and provincial levels to address the overdose crisis in our communities?" Uh, so, Anami, uh, you're up first. Yes, and as I said, um, the community that I'm running to represent is, is the epicenter of the uh, opioid epidemic in this country. And um, in Toronto, it represents a third of the emergency calls um, you know, of suspected opioid. I mean, they still call it, well, I think they call them incidents now because in general, they're not overdoses, they're poisonings. Mm -hmm. um, it has absolutely ravaged our community and uh, our communities, and it has spiked during the pandemic. You know, this is one of these, these things of, of unintended consequences, um, but exactly why you can't have a patchwork of social services, you can't have an incomplete social safety net, uh, because there were people receiving their checks, and without supports, without mental health services, without... Um, you know, community um, um, uh, support uh, and um, um, living arrangements. Um, they were cashing their checks, or predators were cashing the checks for them, and then um, they were they were um, overdosing or being poisoned. So mm -hmm. the Green Party of Canada and I absolutely support um, absolutely more than ever uh, the decriminalization of illicit drugs and uh, the creation of a safe supply. And it's the two. It's not enough to decriminalize. Um, you know, possession of small amounts, um, which we know the the uh, um, the attorney general, um, as attorney um, slash solicitor general has um, has instructed. Um, it's um, uh, it's oh my gosh, my words are failing me. Uh, it's uh, what are they called? <laughs> Prosecutors. Thank you. Oh my gosh, and I'm a lawyer, so there you go. Uh, it's prosecutors uh, um, to you know, to not enforce. Uh, it's not just about decriminalization. Without a safe supply, people will continue to die. It is just that simple. It's just that simple. So we need to address that first, and then we need to bring in all of the missing um, community support, social services, mental health services, um, affordable housing, guaranteed livable income. You know, all of those things are part of an interconnected whole. We've learned that during the pandemic, and it certainly applies to the opioid um, epidemic. I'll just um, I'll just follow up because uh, yeah we're in agreement and one of the things that I've said um, is we have to recognize this as a health emergency and we followed the guidelines of our health experts in COVID nineteen because we've recognized it as a health emergency we have to do the same we have to follow the evidence and the guidelines of the health experts on that and recognize that again the goal needs to be that people can get well. How do we help people get well? What is needed? And so it's, it's, it's as you say, enemy, the decriminalization, the safe supply, the supports, the treatment in community. And, and in so many cases, um, you know, people need a place to live. I think of um, in, here in Cowden because of COVID, uh, there, was, there was the capacity suddenly uh, for BC housing work to work with the local communities and to provide emergency housing for people. And when I speak with people that have gotten into that housing, uh, just that level of stability of knowing where am I going to sleep tonight? Am I in a safe place? Can I count on a safe place to sleep at night? Allows for that stabilization to begin, for the treatment to begin, for the health and wellness to begin to be restored. And then also recognizing that it's not just people who are homeless and on the street who are dying from poisonous drug supply. Right. It is a lot of people in homes, in their own houses. Uh, I spoke to a woman today uh, who recently lost her son. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and let's remember this. These are sons and daughters. These are mothers and fathers, husbands and wives, brothers and sisters. They are people who are losing their lives to this poison. Uh, and it is our job uh, to try to address this as a health emergency. 
Okay, Kate, you have to talk really loudly next time. Yeah, sorry. Okay, so thank you both for uh, for those answers. Uh, we have had, you know, great discussion and I recognize that it's late in Toronto, but um, would you both be willing to stay for just another, you know, five or 10 minutes after seven so we can ask uh, two more questions? Let's yeah. do two more questions. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you both for your thoughtful answers. And our next question is from Gary. And Gary asks, how do we ensure that the BC Greens and the Federal Greens run the most diverse slate of candidates in the next election? Uh, so Sonia, uh, you're up first. Yeah. Uh, so we have to work. We have to make sure that we do the work to make that happen. And, and um, one of the things about the SNAP election uh, one week into being leader was, uh, you know, the phone calls that I made, particularly to candidates of color, particularly to women, um, and saying to them, you have 24 hours to decide whether you're running in a provincial election campaign. So many of them said, I, I can't, I can't drop my life. I can't yeah. just stop uh, and, and do this for the next four weeks. And so my commitment is that on the other side of this SNAP election, um, we start building that and we start building that diversity. And I, I really wanna say, and Ryan Clayton, if you are on the call, mm -hmm. you have begun this work beautifully because our, our candidates in Vancouver and the lower mainland are diverse, are young, bring incredible expertise and uh, astonishing uh, experience and commitment to their communities, to the table. And, and I'm already told Ryan, uh, he and I are going to be doing work around the province to do exactly the same thing. Uh, it, it won't happen by accident. We will not get diversity by accident. We have to make it a priority. We have to support candidates uh, so that they can be uh, successful in elections. Uh, and we have to approach politics in a very different way. It's for so long, it's been, uh, you know, you bring your network, you bring your uh, wealth, you bring your privilege to the table, and that's kind of opens the door to politics. And we have to recognize that that's not the way uh, it's going to work in the BC Green Party anymore, and clearly not in the federal Green Party. Uh, and and it's it has to be our commitment. Mm -hmm. In in the federal case, um, I I have no proof of this, and I am you know my background is extremely evidence-based, fact-based. I'm a you know, policy analyst by training. Um, so I have nothing but anecdotal proof or, or my sense of this, but I do believe that in electing me, this was an intentional decision of uh, the members to prioritize uh, diversifying the party. I made no bones about it. I made it very clear uh, when I ran that diversity was a priority for me. Um, because I believe that it was a barrier to our progress as a party, our barrier to winning more seats wherever we are in the country, and also um, a contradiction uh, of our values. Um, respect for diversity is one of them, and we can't, we have to reflect that internally if we're going to um, sell it to anyone externally, you know. Uh, young people, especially, including my kids just sniff out hypocrisy every time. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we, we have to really, we had to walk the talk. Um, and then it's just, it's a tremendous waste of talent. Um, you know, it's a tremendous waste of talent at a time when we can't afford it because we know that uh, great ideas come from everywhere. And as someone who worked in this area, who, who uh, founded the first institute in Canada, really advancing knowledge in this area, doing training and advocacy on uh, the issue of political underrepresentation amongst marginalized groups. Um, you know, we know that diversity brings better public policy outcomes. And just, you know, I'll give just one simple one and just say, um, don't we think it's more likely that if we're talking about um, racism and policing, for instance, or our criminal justice system, that we're less likely to create policies that reinforce that systemic discrimination if the people most impacted you know, Indigenous peoples, Black Canadians are actually represented when the policies are being developed, not afterward, once they've been developed in a consultation, but truly involved in, in developing them. Mm -hmm. And so I think we know the answer. Um, so in terms of our party, uh, what we need to do, and it's, you know, it sounds formulaic, but it's, it's quite simple. Um, it's two things. First, in terms of what we can all do, 
We need to um, uh, scout, recruit, support, and then vote. And so the first is scouting. Everyone should be the eyes and ears in their community for that talent. If you see leadership, not even non-traditional, it doesn't have to be political leadership, but if you see leadership, uh, then you know, keep your eyes out, eyes and ears out, um, alert for it, and scout it, and then recruit it. Um, most people from um, underrepresented groups, they don't see themselves in politics, and so they don't imagine a place for themselves there. So they need someone to actively say to them, usually more than once. In the case of women, it's three times. A woman normally has to be asked three times to run before they will seriously consider it. So recruit it, and and recruit and recruit. Ask three times and then support it. Uh, I'm sure Sonia will tell you, and Kate, I'm sure you're learning this, that the financial resources um, are one thing, but certainly you need the human resources. People who don't just say, you should run, but also say, if you run, I will be there for you. And I will help you raise money. I will help you find volunteers. You know, I will help you with your website. All of those skills that you need to really run a credible campaign. And then finally vote for those people. You know, when you see good candidates uh, from those communities um, presenting themselves, vote for them. And thank you to everyone who chose to vote for me. So that's, um, that's what everyone can do. You know, that is simple. And if we do that work, we can transform things very quickly. Um, the other thing though, is that this is a systemic problem. And so um, the Green Party at every single level, our party and our cousins, we need to do the work of creating the internal um, infrastructure that supports uh, diversity. We need to deconstruct barriers. We need to identify them where they exist. Um, and then the same thing, all of our policies should be put through the lens of how does it promote and support diversity um, within our party. And this is the way that you get there because I can tell you, and this should be comforting to everyone, um, that we have decades of research that confirms that if you run women and people of color in competitive ridings, they win. Uh, women are more electable than men. That's just a fact. Um, that's what the research tells us. And people of color are just as electable as anyone else, as long as they're running in an electable riding. So that's the good news. Um, I just want to say, Bill Marshall, you are very observant to note that I am petting the dog. Everyone knows that, Sonia. He's not that observant. <laughs> That is very to us all. He really wants to play. Oh, someone asked, what is an electable riding? An electable riding is one where the polling tells you that you have a chance of being elected. Uh, your party has a chance of being elected. So one of the things that, um, that often happens, um, not in our party, because unfortunately, we're not even that far ahead. Uh, people uh, heard me say during the leadership race that the Green Party ran the least diverse slate of candidates of all of the major political parties. And that includes the People's Party of Canada. Uh, so, you know, we, uh, we have a lot of work to do. Um, but the other parties, they, you know, they have uh, more developed policies. And uh, in some cases, the more evolved of them uh, will have policies about ensuring that you at least seek out um, uh, candidates from underrepresented groups to run in those winnable ridings, the ones where you actually have a shot um, of getting elected. Um, so that it's not just tokenism and, uh, you know, you see that, you see um, that they have done much, much better in terms of having real diversity, not just amongst their candidates, but also amongst the people who get elected. Great, thank you. And uh, with that, we're, we're going to wrap up. So my last question for Sonia and Anami, uh, we'll go with Sonia first, is what is your, what is your message to voters right now in, mm. in BC as we quickly approach election day. I'm gonna let Sonia have the last word. So I'm okay, you go, only so that you can have the last word as you yeah. should, as is fitting in this discussion. Um, first, just to say thank you to everyone for being here. Mm -hmm. um, this is a wonderful turnout. Uh, I think it's completely fitting that Kate and Sonia should have such a great turnout. Um, and you know what I want to see in BC because it really is just a thing that ties a bone everything that we said. Uh, first, there is a role for government. Um, we've, we, we, we were reminded of that during the pandemic. It's the first place that we all turned um, for help and relief and direction. Um, and so um, we, we remember that. And so therefore we know that it is important that we elect good leadership. Uh, and then speaking of good leadership, 
everything, every piece of legislation is just simply words until we put people in place that have political courage, that are willing to say what needs to be said and do what needs to be done with one singular focus, which is what is in the interest of the community, writ, you know, small and also writ large. Um, and so that is where leadership like Kate and Sonia comes in. That is the option that you're providing to people in BC. And it is so needed right now. I'm very sorry you, you were uh, put in this situation uh, where um, this cynical and opportunistic situation of this snap election. Um, but I believe that people are going to, uh, first of all, they're going to um, reject that cynicism and they want more than anything the kind of hope that Sonia uh, was talking about. They want to believe that they can select leadership that is going to lead BC in a better, uh, more sustainable, more just direction. So we are here to help in any way we can as Federal Greens. Please always call on us. Um, and Sonia, you know, we're, we're, we're in this together. We're, we're like a little sisterhood here. So, and Kate as well, welcome to the sisterhood. And um, please, um, please call on me whenever you need me. Oh my gosh, Anna me. I, I just want to point out it's 10 o'clock. You're in the middle of an election campaign and you are so articulate. I said to Maeve earlier tonight, I was like, I'm going to be on with Anna me. And I, I always feel like a slightly dumbfounded uh, person around her because she's you're just incredible the way you speak and how articulate and and effective you are at conveying what matters so much um i'm going to be a bit more uh well let's see what will i say to voters this is the time this is an election right now to vote for what you want to vote with a belief that we can do better than we are not to believe the old stories of how politics and government has to be. We can write a new story right now for BC. We really can. And it can be a story where politicians recognize that we have a, a deep responsibility to be in service, not to our parties, but to the people of this province. And imagine if everything we were doing was from a place of service. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's, that's possible um, but for it to be possible, we need green seats in the legislature. And so in this election, uh, vote, vote for that, vote for what's possible and, and vote green and, and be in a place of inspiration and joy. In 2017, people would walk up to me after I was standing in Duncan on the day of the election and, and people just came up to me for hours and said, I've never felt this way when I voted. I've never felt joy when I voted. And you can, you can vote from a point, place of joy. And, and that's, what, uh, that's what it should always feel like. No matter who you're voting for, it should feel joyful. So thank you, Kate. Thank you, Anna Me. Thank you to everybody that joined us tonight. Uh, this has been lovely and inspiring, and I, it fills my cup back up. We have two more days. I know, Anime, you have four more days. Yeah. Um, I can't wait to hear the great news of your election. Uh, our parliament will be so much uh, better served to have you there. And uh, Kate, you just keep being the most amazing and astonishing person that you are. Yeah. Uh, and thank you all for joining us tonight. I just, I just want to finish up by uh, thanking Sonia and Anami and echoing uh, their messages. Uh, so thank you to them and thank you all for joining us online. You know, we have a choice. What happens next? It's up to all of us. Mm -hmm. And especially after, after tonight, after this discussion, we all know that we need to be more responsible with our planet. Mm -hmm. We need to be more inclusive in our democracy. Mm -hmm. And we need to be making plans now that are safeguarding our future. Mm -hmm. So my, my final message to everyone is that if you are one of those who has the right to vote on October 24th, which is this Saturday in British Columbia, or on October 26th, this Monday in Toronto Centre, vote green. And uh, for everyone listening, if you'd like to volunteer on election day, you can find the links uh, in the chat to either volunteer for the BC Greens or volunteer on Anime's campaign. Thank you all again for joining us. Thank you to Sonia and Anime, and have a good night. Thank you. Thank you, Thank everyone. Thank you so much. Lovely to see you, Anna. Have a wonderful Thank evening. You. Bye, Sonia. Bye, Kate. Bye.